بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, We welcome all of you once again to our online قصيرة uh, البردة lessons uh, on behalf of the Hamim Foundation uh, UK. So inshallah, we uh, continue uh, today uh, with from where we stopped the last uh, last time last week. Uh, we have co completed the first two chapters of the Burda and we did one line from the third chapter. So we shall uh, continue uh, from uh, there inshallah. Uh, Yes, uh, and just to recap, the first uh, chapter of the Burda was in uh, expressing the yearning and the love and the passion uh, for the beloved. Uh, I say that because in the first chapter, he doesn't mention who the beloved is. Okay, And that's the style of the Arabic uh, ghazal, love poetry. In the, in the beginning, they don't mention. So that's why I say it's in yearning and love for the beloved. I don't say the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he didn't mention the Prophet yet, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. In the second chapter, he uh, then attacks the nafs. So the first chapter is about the heart and its yearnings for the beloved, which is high and sublime and, and uh, spiritual. The second chapter is about the nafs, which is the lower self. And to fight the nafs and to uh, uh, attack, uh, you know, the, 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 the nafs and to uh, how we, we, we uh, have to curb the desires of the nafs and how we need to be beware of the nafs and its tricks all the time. Uh, and how the two are connected is that you cannot uh, achieve the desire of the heart, which is the love of the heart, which is the love of the Prophet وسلم, which is from the love of Allah. That cannot be achieved if you are still a slave of the nafs. So uh, the fight against the nafs is uh, very necessary for the life of the heart. If you want your heart to thrive, then you need your nafs to die. And if your nafs is thriving uh, and well and alive then uh, your heart is going to die so if your nafs is very active then the heart is going to be weak while if the nafs is weak then the heart is going to be strong so that's the connection between the first two chapters because uh, i mean a lot of people might wonder that what's the, what's the point of talking about the heart and the nafs uh, in a poem that's basically apparent, I mean, about the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's about love for the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad al-Rasul. So why is he talking about the heart and the nafs and all that? Because all of those are connected. The love of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is a matter of the heart. And uh, it cannot be uh, achieved if the nafs is still coming in the way and the shaitan as well. So the first two chapters are about that. The third chapter... He continues with the top, the same uh, theme a little bit, but moving into the third theme, which is the actual uh, mention of the beloved, which is Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then the qualities of the beloved, the greatness of the beloved, the beauty of the beloved. In other words, is in the third chapter, he's telling you why he loves the beloved. So what's so great about your beloved? He mentions that. So the Arab poets would do that. First, they will mention how much they love their beloved, right? Uh, just, you know, how much they miss their beloved, uh, miss your loved one. And then they would talk about the barriers and the distances between you and the loved one. And in our case, with the Prophet ﷺ, the barrier and the distance is the nafs and the shaitan. Shaitan and the nafs keep us away from him. So they, they talk about the barrier and the distance. And in the third part, they would talk about uh, the beloved himself or herself and then they would describe the beautiful qualities of the beloved why do I love the beloved what's so beautiful about my beloved 
So those poets were, you know, romantic poets. They would write about, uh, oh, uh, their beloved, if the beloved was a woman, you know, uh, they would praise uh, the beautiful hair and the beautiful eyes and, and, and those things. That's what you find in the love, romantic poetry of the Arabs. Uh, in this case, this is a poem for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here he's going to now describe the beautiful qualities of his beloved, uh, which in this case uh, is not necessarily about, you know, uh, bodily attributes. Uh, although even the, even the, the Prophet sallam, even in his bodily appearance and attribute was the most beautiful of men and the most beautiful of people, but more so about his character, his miracles, his, his rank with Allah, his, his cosmic uh, role in this universe, uh, and all those beautiful things about him, uh, uh, what he means to us. So he's going to talk about all those things in this chapter. He's going to now tell you why he loves the beloved, why he's the beloved. But he starts off by saying, Zalamtu sunnata manahiya zalama ila anishtakat qadamahu durra min warami. He says, indeed, I have been unfair to the sunnah of the one who kept up the night alive until in worship, until his feet were swollen with pain. So here he says that I have been unfair to the sunnah of the Prophet I talk about the Prophet and my love and for him and so on. Uh, but have I really followed his sunnah? And he says, no, I have been unfair to his sunnah. Uh, the sunnah of, of, of the one who would stay up the entire night in prayer until his feet would be swollen in pain. So has any of us ever stayed up the whole night in prayer that our feet are swollen? We, we don't do that. So, uh, but then we, we claim to follow the sunnah and we are upon the sunnah. So he's trying, by, by mentioning that example of how the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pray the whole night until his feet would literally get swollen. Uh, he's trying to tell us that we are very far from the sunnah and there is no way that we could be 100% upon the sunnah. Uh, we do small little things. Uh, we, I eat with the right hand, mashallah, I follow the sunnah, uh, you know, um, so on. And we do all these, I use a miswak or I say alhamdulillah when I sneeze. And we say alhamdulillah, we are following the sunnah. And now, yes, these are sunnahs and mashallah. Uh, but really, the, the way of the Prophet, وسلم, the sunnah of the Prophet, that is something very big. And where can we ever uh, be, be upon that in, in, in a 100% way or even a 90% way? How do we? Uh, it, it's a big challenge. There are people who do achieve that great awliya, Allah and salihin. Uh, but uh, where are we from the sunnah of the one who would spend the entire night in prayer until his feet would be swollen? Where are we from that? So we are very far from that. And Imam Busiri starts a chapter uh, by acknowledging that, by acknowledging that. Acknowledging our weakness uh, and uh, our distance from the way of the Prophet ﷺ, despite our claims of love and obedience and all of that. And then he, he mentions again, talking about the sunnah, So here he says, Allah uh, Sayyidina Muhammad, uh, he said, uh, the one who would... Uh, the one who would uh, pray and, uh, the whole night until his feet were swollen. And then in this way it says, and also the one, also the one who would tie up a belt uh, on his stomach, on his waist. He says, he would tie a, a stomach, uh, uh, tie a, 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 a belt or a rope on his waist with a stone underneath of it due to hunger. Sahabin means uh, hunger, due to hunger. So uh, he so he would then say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, out of hunger, often he would do that, out of hunger, there were occasions when he did that, the Sahaba saw him like that, he would, uh, he would be so hungry, there would be no food, that he would actually take a stone and he would tie it on his stomach, on and Imam Busari says, Kashan mutrafal adami, on that soft and gentle skin of his. Imam Busari again praises the, the beloved of the beauty of the beloved. He says, on that soft 
and gentle skin of his sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would take a stone and put it there on his waist and then he would tie a belt tight tightly on his stomach uh, out of hunger now imagine uh, what kind of hunger is that has any of us ever been hungry like that yes we, we get hungry uh, people complain oh we are in lockdown and we cannot go to all these nice restaurants and and takeouts and and so on but have you been so hungry my brother and my sister that you literally picked up a stone and put it here and then you tied your belt tightly to to, to pull, push your, your your stomach back because you are so hungry have you ever done that in our entire life no we haven't yes we felt hungry but not that hungry but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam ruhi fida would would, would uh, feel that hungry sometimes he would feel that hungry sometimes and and this boggles our mind how come allah's rasul allah's nabi allah's beloved for the, the one for whom allah created the heavens and the earth how can he go hungry like that why, why, why wouldn't allah provide for him but that wasn't the thing so uh, allah will provide for him and allah did offer to provide for him one day when rasulullah was hungry like that uh, Jibreel alayhi salam came to him, came to him with, with gold, with an offer of gold, came, came to him and said, and this is in the second line, He says, and indeed the Prophet would do that, he would tie a belt on his stomach out of hunger, which is with a stone underneath of it, and some Sahaba would do it with him. Say, Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar, there were other Sahaba who would do the same with him. Abu Huraira, Bilal says he would do that. And despite the fact that Jibreel alayhi salam came to him once, Allah sent Jibreel, and he had two angels with him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Salam alayka, Ya Rasulullah, if you wish, Allah has sent these two angels with me, if you wish, they can turn. The whole mountain of Uhud into gold for you. The mountain of Uhud is a mountain in Medina. It says they can give you uh, the entire mountain as gold. Right? Or they can give you uh, so much gold uh, like the side. They will they give you gold the side of the mountain of Uhud. So much gold. In other words, it's all a metaphor for they can give you endless wealth. Allah can give you, Ya Muhammad, وسلم, endless wealth. So much wealth that you will never ever go have to go hungry. Uh, they give you so much money, so much gold. So the Prophet Ali uh, replied and said, No, O Jibreel, I am satisfied with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah decides for me, um, I will eat uh, one day akunu uh, shakira and be grateful to him and i will be hungry one day and be patient with him so one day i will make shukr and the other day i will make sabr he said i'm, I'm satisfied with that one day i will make shukr with allah and the other day i will make sabr with allah both of these are acts of ibadah to have to make shukr to allah to be grateful to allah is an act of worship it's a great act of worship it is it is more greater than all your salah and taraweeh and all that just to be grateful Imam al Shadili radiallahu anhu says, Zarra min amal al qulub, Tusawi al Jibal, min amal al Jawarih, that an atom's weight of the heart, the actions of the heart, an atom's weight of the actions of the heart is greater than mountains from the actions of the limbs, from the actions of the limbs. An atom's weight of the actions of the heart is greater in value. Then mountains from the actions of the limbs. It, because the actions of the heart are what really matters. Your actions of the limbs of the body are only valuable if they're following the heart. But otherwise, they don't really mean nothing if they're not really following your heart. If you pray and pray and pray and pray, but your heart is not with Allah, the prayer is meaningless. But if your heart is with Allah, even if you didn't pray and pray so much, but your heart is with Allah, that will count. So Imam Shadali said that atom's weight of the actions of the hearts is greater than mountains from the actions of the limbs. So shukr, to be the, the state of being grateful to Allah, uh, is is an act of the heart. 
is an ibadah. Likewise, sabr, uh, to, to be patient uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, uh, uh, you know, uh, destiny and whatever he writes for you, whatever he puts out for you, to be patient with that, right? Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes there's a day uh, when things are going good, there are days when things are maybe not so well, or, or things are difficult. So, Allah uh, Masallahu Alaihi Muhammad, that also, sabr, to have sabr, patience, is also an act of ibadah. It's a great act of ibadah. It's an act of the heart, by the way. Patience is not something you do with your hands. Okay, I'm, I'm doing patience now. No, it's something in here. You either have that patience or you don't have it. Sabr. So, uh, when Jibreel Alayhi Salam offers uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi Wasallam mountains of gold when he sees him like that, it's also a test from Allah. You know, it's a test from Allah to, to, to demonstrate uh, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's state of heart. Okay, Ya Rasulullah, you are so hungry. There's no food in Medina uh, and, and there's nothing, you know, there uh, to buy and so on. There's no money. So you are so hungry. Well, here, you know, we, we're going to give you more gold than the mountain of Uhud. Are you going to go for that? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, no. I will, uh, I will not accept that. Uh, I'm satisfied the way I am. I eat one day and I'm, I'm grateful to Allah. I make shukr. And I am, I, I'll be, I'm hungry one day and I make sabr. And I enjoy both uh, ibadat. And I enjoy uh, the closeness to Allah that I experience in both ibadat. It's like, uh, it's like somebody says, do you want to only pray and not fast? Or do you only want to fast and not pray? Right? But right now we fast and we pray. And the answer we're going to give is, uh, no, we want to fast and we want to pray. We love the experience we have of Allah while we pray. And we love the experience we have of Allah while we fast. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that I love uh, the experience I have of Allah, the manifestation I have of Allah when I'm making shukr, when I'm eating. And I love the experience of Allah I have when I'm hungry and when I make sabr, the jamal and the jalal. Both of them bring us closer to Allah. So he said to Jibreel, no, I'm fine. I'm good. Uh, I don't want that much wealth. Uh, Sulaiman alayhi salam was a nabi that was a king. He had that much wealth. So our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa chose to, to, to be an ascetic. He wasn't forced. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was not uh, what we call today a poor man in the sense of that he didn't have the means or he didn't have the wealth. Everything was offered to him. He chose to stay away from the dunya because he was satisfied with what Allah wrote for him and the way he did, uh, the way he uh, experienced shukr and sabr. So that's what Imam al-Usari says in the second line, the, uh, the, the third line here, that indeed, even though the mountains were offered to him in gold, and he showed those mountains a loftier character, a higher character. Mountains are usually very high, right? So Jibreel Ali Salam offered the Prophet Sallallahu and mountains were size of wealth. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed him even higher character. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi showed Jibreel a character even higher than that mountain. Which is by saying, uh, no, I'm, I'm satisfied with the will of Allah. And there are many beautiful stories of some of the Sahaba that would sometimes uh, invite the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to their homes uh, when they see him in that condition. They say one day, uh, there's a narration that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day left his, the house uh, uh, like that. He was walking around in the streets of Medina hungry. Uh, and then said, he met Sayyidina Abu Bakr and then he met Sayyidina Umar. And they also had come out for the same reason. And then when all three of them were together and they looked at each other as if, are you out for the same reason? I'm out like, are you hungry? Because it's like lunchtime, but I'm on the road, on the street, and you're on the street, me on the street. What, what, what are we doing here outside? Everybody at home eating. So they asked each other, are you out here for the hunger? And all three of them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar, all of them, uh, turned out that all of them were out there on the street because they were all hungry and had nothing to eat. And then one of the Sahaba saw them in that condition and asked them, are you here? Why are you here? He realized that they are hungry and he invited them all to his house for a meal. 
And there's a long, beautiful story of that. Uh, so there are many stories of the, the of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His uh, <clears throat> zuhd. He was a zahid, somebody who, who who detached himself from the dunya and was satisfied with whatever Allah put out for him. So that is the sunnah. Imam Busari is saying that is the real sunnah. So can we claim to follow the sunnah? Have we tied stones on our stomach out of hunger? Have we stay? Have we spent the entire day hungry? Have we spent the entire night praying? So if we haven't done that, if we haven't spent the entire day hungry, <clears throat> no breakfast, no lunch, no food, nothing, and we haven't spent the entire night praying, we shouldn't uh, claim to be upon the sunnah or anything like that. In fact, we should rather say what Imam Busari said: "Zalam tu sunnah taman." Uh, indeed, I have been unfair to his sunnah. And then after mentioning the incident of the mountains, Imam Busari said, He says that uh, and the fact that the Prophet was hungry, but despite that, uh, he rejected uh, the offer that was made to him. And that is what proves uh, how detached he was from the dunya. His detachment from the dunya is proved by the fact, not by the fact that he didn't have the dunya. Not having the dunya doesn't mean you're not de you're detached from the dunya. There are many people out there today on the streets, even homeless people, they don't have the dunya. They own nothing in the dunya, but are the saints. Does that mean that they are detached from the dunya? No, they are not. They love the dunya. They want the dunya. They beg for the dunya. And if the dunya is given to them, they're going to take it. So simply not having the dunya doesn't mean that you are uh, detached from the dunya. Okay? Doesn't mean that. Uh, what, what proves your true detachment from the dunya is that if the dunya is offered to you, and you say no thanks. Right? When the wealth and the dunya is offered to you, and you say, no, I'm fine. No, thanks. That is what will make you a Zahid, somebody who is detached from the dunya. So Imam Busari said in this verse here, and indeed what proves, and that, he said the story of the mountains that he quoted, that is what proves his true Zuhd, his detachment from the dunya. Because it was offered to him, but he rejected it, despite the fact that he needed it. And there's another point here. Let's say the dunya is offered to you, but you have a lot of money, you have wealth, and you're okay, but more is offered to you. And you might say, well, you know what, I'm a rich guy, I have a lot of wealth, uh, so it's okay, don't give it to me. Somebody wants to give you a million rands or a million dollars, and but you're already a millionaire. So you say, it's fine, rather give it to somebody else. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are a Zahid, you're a good man, but, bet, you know, it, it, it's understandable still. But what's greater than that is a million dollars offered to you and you actually have nothing. You have nothing and you are in need of it. You are hungry. You are thirsty. You don't have a place to stay. Uh, uh, you have expenses. You have bills to pay. You are in need of it, but you still say no thanks. Alhamdulillah. I will, Allah, I will rely on Allah and however Allah helps me. Or what comes his way. That is a greater, I mean, sign, right, of, of zuhud, of otherworldliness, detachment from the dunya. So in the case of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a need, right? He was hungry. He would tie the stone to his stomach. That means he was hungry. He needed that. But he still said no. He still refused the offer. So that is really what proves the maqam uh, of the Prophet ﷺ, the status of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, in, in when it comes to uh, his ascetism, his uh, detachment from the dunya. He was not simply a person who didn't have the dunya. It didn't come his way. So, you know, he was just poor. No, it came his way. It was offered to him and he needed it at that time. But he said, no, I prefer to live like this between shukr and sabr. Alhamdulillah, it's not like we're hungry every single day. We eat. And then we suffer a little bit, then we are hungry, and then we eat. Alhamdulillah, he said, I'm okay like that. So that is uh, the way of the Prophet, Ali Salatu Wasalam.
because he was from the ma'sumin, those who are protected by Allah. And then Imam Busiri says, وَكَيْفَ تَدْعُوا إِلَى الدُّنْيَا بَرُورَةُ مَنْ لَوْ لَهُ لَمْ تَخْرُجِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْعَدَمِ And indeed, how can uh, any need for anything of the dunya influence the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Whatever need he may have had, how can it ever influence him? How can any need in for the dunya influence him when the dunya needed him to be in order to be created? When the dunya needed him in order to be created. So the dunya was created for his sake, alayhi salatu wa salam, wa alihi al-kiram. So it's not that he needs the dunya. The reality is, al Busairi says in the Burda, the dunya needs him. He doesn't need the dunya. <clears throat> the dunya needs him. Because لَوْ لَهُ لَمْ تَخْرِجُ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْعَدَمِ Without him, the dunya would not have come out of non-existence. لَوْ لَهُ Were it not for him, لَمْ تَخْرِجُ الدُّنْيَا The dunya would not have come out مِنَ الْعَدَمِ Of non-existence. The dunya did not exist. Allah created the dunya for the sake of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And this is mentioned in a hadith. <coughs> it's narrated by Tabarani. And mentioned by a Suyuti in a Dural Mansur, uh, his tafsir, that uh, <clears throat> when uh, our father Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, when he uh, when he uh, was uh, taken out of Jannah after the the mistake that he made of eating from the tree, then he was removed from Jannah and he came to the earth. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. He prayed for forgiveness for many, many years. Some narrations even mentioned 300 years. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not answer him in that period. He, he, he was not given that, that, that answer uh, yet. So after 300 years, the narration says that Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam uh, raised his hands and made a dua. He said, Allahumma bihaqi, as'aluka bihaqi Muhammadin and takhfir ali. Oh Allah, I ask you for the sake of Muhammad to forgive me. For the sake of Muhammad to forgive me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately answered Adam alayhi salam and said, Oh Adam, uh, the first answer was first answer was, and how do you know who is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam? Because Adam is saying, Oh Allah, forgive me for the sake of Muhammad. How do you know who is Muhammad? So Adam alayhi salam replied. Uh, ya Allah, when you created me in Jannah and blew the ruh into me, the soul, and I became alive, and I became alive, uh, when I looked right throughout Jannah, when I looked all over Jannah, everywhere in Jannah I saw, I noticed that it was written, it was written uh, with uh, all over Jannah, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, your name. And the name of Muhammad next to it. So I reckon to myself that I don't know who is Muhammad, but since his name is written next to your name everywhere in Jannah, he must be certainly the most beloved of people to you. If you write his name next to your name, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, it's right next to each other. So you must love him the most, uh, you, or you must love him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to Adam alayhi salam. He's a Nabi. Allah speaks to him and said that, O oh Adam, indeed, he is the most beloved of my creation to me. He's not just somebody I love. He is the one I love the most. He's the most beloved of my creation to me. And O oh Adam, uh, also note that he will be from your, your children. He will be from your children. So he's not, uh, his species will be from you. He's not an angel. He's not uh, an animal or a bird or a jinn or any of these creatures that Allah created. He will be from your children, O Adam. And O Adam, although he will be from your children, but were it not for him, I would not have created you. Nor would have I created the heavens and the earth. Or the sun and the moon. فَلَوْلَهُ لَمَا خَلَقْتُكَ وَلَا خَلَقْتُ سَمَاءً وَلَا أَرْضًا وَلَا شَمْسًا وَلَا قَمَرًا Were it not for him, I would not have created the sun or the moon or the heavens and the earth or he created you. 
Now that is uh, the maqam of the Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then uh, that Allah created everything for his sake. The dunya was created for his sake. And then Allah said to Adam alayhi salam, and since you have asked me through his name, then be my witness, O Adam, that I forgive you. So our father, o Adam alayhi salam, got forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the blessed name of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam. He asked Allah through that name and he was forgiven. And Allah tells him, I created everything for his sake, including you. Now here I want to highlight uh, an interesting point that usually, you know, Adam alayhi salam is the father and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi is the son, right? He's the great, great grandson. Usually the son is there because of the father. Right? If my father wasn't there, I wouldn't be here. I'm here because of my father, right? So usually uh, the son's existence is dependent on the existence of the father. Every son, every one of us as a son exists because of our father. But look at the maqam of the Prophet wasallam, that he is the son of Adam. But the existence of the father is because of him. The father exists because of him, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So this is the first time that the father owes his existence to the son. That the father can say, I exist because of my son. Otherwise, I, I, wouldn't, not have, I wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for my son. But usually it's the other way around. So that is the maqam of the Prophet, وسلم, And that is why uh, the awliya Allah, the Sufis, they refer to our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Adam al-Arwah. In the books of Sufism, you will find that in the, in the deeper books. Adam al-Arwah, which means the Adam of the souls. The Adam of the souls. So our Prophet Adam alayhi salam, he is the Adam of the bodies, right? He is the father of all the bodies. All human bodies in the world come from Adam alayhi salam. But the Adam of the souls is Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Because Allah created his soul, his ruh, before all other ruhs. And for him, sallallahu alayhi wa Allah created everything else, including Adam alayhi salam. So he is Adam al-Arwah. And in that sense, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the father of Adam alayhi salam. He is the father of Adam alayhi salam in the spiritual sense. And the great uh, Sufi poet, Sultan al-Ashiqeen, the Sultan of the lovers, they call him, Sidi ibn al-Farid. Sidi ibn al-Farid says in a beautiful poem, وَإِنِّي وَإِن كُنْتُ بْنِ آدَمَ صُورَةً فَلِي فِيهِ مَعْنًا شَاهِدٌ بِنُبُوَّتِي وَإِنِّي وَإِن كُنْتُ بْنَ آدَمَ صُورَةً فَلِي فِيهِ مَعْنًا شَاهِدٌ بِأُبُوَّتِي He wrote a poem uh, called uh, At-Ta'iyya. It's called At-Ta'iyya because every line in it ends with a ta. And he wrote that poem على لسان الحقيقة المحمدية in the tongue of the Muhammadan reality. So in that poem, it's not Ibn al-Farid talking about himself. Uh, it's Ibn al-Farid speaking on behalf of, of the ruh of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the reality of the Prophet al-Haqiq al so it's a very deep poem. I mean, it was written in a deep state of intoxication. So uh, in the poem, Ibn al-Farid says, on behalf of Rasulullah, so it's Rasulullah speaking in that sense, says that although I am the son of Adam, outwardly in my appearance, although I am the son of Adam in my appearance, but when it comes to the inner meaning, I am his father. I am his father. So although in the outward appearance I am a son of Adam, but in the e inner meaning of matters, in the inner reality of the and workings of the universe, I am his father. I am his father. So that is Rasulullah speaking. I mean, in, in, in Ibn al-Farid speaking or uh, expressing uh, the, the meaning of uh, the reality of the Prophet wasallam, that he is actually the father of everyone, spiritually. So Imam Busari says, how can the dunya ever be a need for the one without whom the dunya would not have come out of non-existence? As Imam al-Nabahani says, Imam 
in his Hamziya, he says that uh, you, Ya Rasulullah, are the cause of all existence. And were it not for you, everything would have remained in darkness. All things would have remained in their original darkness, which is nothingness. You, Ya Rasulullah, are the cause of all existence. Illatul kawni anta. Walawlaka, were it not for you, everything would have remained in the darkness of non-existence. And that's why, and it is for that reason that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he had no desire for the dunya, and rather the entire dunya and the akhirah were created for him. That makes him the master of all existence. The master of all existence. He is the one that all existence needs to be created. Because of him, all existence was created, while he has no need for any of, ex any of existence. He has no need for any of existence. So he only needs the Rabb, but he doesn't need anything from his existence. That's what makes him the Sayyid, the master of all existence. And that's what Imam Busiri says in the next line. And this is the first place, first time in, in the poem, the love poem, that he actually mentions his beloved. It's, uh, it's in the 34th line, 34th couplet, he says, Muhammadun Sayyidul Kaunaini wa Sakalaini wa Fariqaini min Urbin wa min Ajami. He says, Muhammad. He says, Muhammad. Now, in the 36th line, he mentions his Habib. He says, Muhammadun, Muhammad, the master of the both worlds, Sayyidul Kaunaini. Kaunain is a plural of kaun. One is kaun, and kaunain means double, both worlds. Kaun means the world. Both worlds, kaunain. Muhammad Sallallahu is the master of both worlds, meaning the dunya and the akhirah. The dunya and the, the akhirah, the world that we don't see. Uh, Jannah and Jahannam and all of that. That's all the akhirah. And Allah created this dunya first. When he created everything, he created this dunya first. And then he created Jannah and Jahannam after that. Ibn Arabi says 7,000 years after that. He created the, the, the Akhirah. And then he created the man, the human being at the end of everything, Adam alayhi salam, because dunya and Akhirah is all for us. So, uh, Muhammadun Sayyidul Kaunaini was Sakhalaini. So Muhammad Sallallahu is the master of both worlds, this dunya and the akhirah, was saqalaini, and the two species, which are humans and jinns. Saqalain means the humans and the jinns, the two heavy species. They are called the heavy ones because they are the ones that are meant to carry the sharia and the deen. No other species in creation is to carry the sharia of Allah. It's to carry the sharia of Allah. The Quran was not revealed uh, for the birds and the fishes and, and, and the animals and all that. It is only for the humans and the jinns. So he says, uh, our Prophet Sallallahu is the master of the whole universe, the both worlds. He's the master of the humans and the jinns. And min urbin wa min ajami. And he is the master of the both groups, the Arabs and the non-Arabs. Because the Arabs, they used to divide the whole world into two categories, Arabs and non-Arabs, Arab and Ajam, right? That was like in their minds, in their culture, uh, Arab and non-Arab. So here, I mean, he mentions the stages of the Siyada, Siyada, the, the masterhood, Sayyid, the mastership of the Prophet Sallallahu the mastery of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the master of the Arabs and the non-Arabs. He's not only the master of the Arabs, He's not only the chief and the best of all the Arabs. He's the master of the Arabs and non-Arabs. Meaning all human beings. Arabs and non-Arabs. All human beings. He's the master of all human beings. Then he goes forward and says, but no. He's not only the master of all human beings. Was Saqalaini. He is the Sayyid, the master of all human beings and all jinns. Jinn and humans are all under him. Even the jinns have to believe in him and follow him and obey him and support him. Like they would in his lifetime. Many jinn would come and give bayah to him and accept Islam on him and read Quran to him. We have many stories of that. There are many jinn sahaba. Right? Although, I mean, we don't have too much information on them, but they were there. So he is not only the master of the Arabs and the non-Arabs, only the humanity. 
humans. He is also the master of the humans and the jinns. And then he goes further and he says, well, uh, he's not only the master of the humans and the jinns only, he is the master of all that is there. He is the master of both worlds. He is the master of all existence. Because once you say Sayyidul Kaunain, the master of the dunya, this dunya, and the master of the akhira, the next dunya, khalas, everything is included in that. Everything. He is the master of everything. He is the head master of the angels. He is the master of Jannah. He is the master of the prophets. He is the master of the jinns. He is the master of everything. Everything is under him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is none above him. Illa Allah. As uh, al Nabhani says in, in, his, in, in, in his, his, his poem, Al Hamziya, also, this is not the Hamziya of Busiri, but the Hamziya of Al Nabhani. Uh, he says, All I can say in your praise, Ya Rasulullah, that the whole world, the entire universe, is all under you. And above you is only Allah, and then after that, there is nothing. Above you is only Allah. So Rasulullah is uh, uh, above him is only Allah. There is nothing else above him. He is above all creation. He is above all of us. And above him is only Allah. So he is second only to Allah. As the great uh, Persian poet uh, uh, Jami, sorry, Sa'di, Sa'di said, Sheikh Sa'di said, La yumkinu thana'u kama kana haqquhu ba'das khuda buzruktu yi qissa mukhtasar. He said that nobody can praise him وسلم, like what he deserves. Ba'das khuda buzruktui. After Allah, you are the master of all existence. Qissa mukhtasar. That is the whole story in short. That's the whole story in short. After Allah is his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa He is the Sayyidul Wujud. The master of all existence on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, uh, and the word Sayyid has been used by the Prophet himself, for himself. He one day stood on the member and said, Ana Sayyidu walad Adam. I am the Sayyid, the master of all the children of Adam alayhi salam. Adam woman tuna udahta liwai. Adam alayhi salam and all the prophets will be under my banner on the day of judgment. Then he says, Nabiyun al Amirun nahi fala ahadun abarra fi kaulila min hu wa la naami. And indeed, our Prophet Nabiyuna al Amirun nahi, the one who commands commands good and forbids bad, and forbids evil. He is the one who commanded good and he is the one who forbade us from evil. And indeed, there was no one more truthful than him ever in saying yes or no to anything. There was no one more truthful than our Prophet ﷺ. No one ever was more truthful than him in his yes and in his no. So whenever, if the Prophet ﷺ told us to do something, uh, gave us the yes, there was no one more truthful than that in his advice and what he said. And if he stopped us from something and he said no, then there was no, no one more truthful than him in what he stopped us from. So he is the most truthful one who ever said yes and no. Because me and you, I can tell you to do something, but meanwhile, that is not good for you, right? I'm not being truthful. I can stop you from something which is actually good for you, but I stop you from it. We can do that as human beings. But our Prophet ﷺ, whatever he told us to do, it was for, for our own benefit, for our own benefit. And whatever he stopped us from was for our own benefit. That's why he says, Nabiyuna, our Prophet, the, the one who commanded good, al amirun nahi and the one who stopped from evil, forbade from evil. And indeed, no one was more truthful than him in his commanding and in his forbidding. So we believe that. And that's why as Muslims, we should never ever doubt the commands of Allah and His Prophet, and we should never ever doubt the prohibitions of Allah and His Prophet because they are only for our benefit and nothing more truthful uh, can be. The government says, don't jump a red light. You see a red light, traffic light, and, we, and the government says, the law of the country says, don't cross it, and we don't. We respect that. What about the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the green lights and the red lights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's nothing more truthful than that. Then he says, Then 
He is the beloved. He who al Habib. He is the beloved, whose intercession is hope for, whose dua intercession is when he prays to Allah for you. When I pray to Allah for myself, that's dua for myself, right? But if I pray to Allah for you, then that is called shafa'ah, intercession. Intercession. So he says here, he is the Habib, he is the beloved, whose intercession, whose dua we seek in every calamity. And indeed, it is uh, <clears throat> in every calamity that faces us. He is the one whose dua and intercession is hope in every calamity or fear that faces us. Muqtahimi means something that faces you, that, that, that uh, attacks you. So whenever any fear or calamity attacks us, it is the intercession of his, him, sallallahu, that beloved that we seek. And really, as Muslims, uh, our hope with Allah is through his Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We cannot hope that Allah will have mercy on us because of our prayers or our fast or our sadaqah and our these things because how much do we do? What do we do? How pious are we anyways? You know, uh, how uh, how good is our prayers and our fast? It's nothing. Our amal are nothing. Our actions are nothing. If we have any hope or our greatest hope, maybe we can have some hope in our actions, but our greatest hope in attracting Allah's mercy it is our connection to his beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we are his ummah we are his followers we are his lovers that is the reason for which we hope allah to have mercy on us and this is quranic allah says wa ma kana allah li yu'adhibhum wa anta fihim that uh, allah said to the people of makkah i will not punish you as long as my prophet is amongst you so the presence of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam amongst the kuffar of makkah kept the bala away from them. Because Abu Jahl came to Rasulullah and said, why doesn't your Rabb send his azab on us? Send his bala on us. You always tell us these stories of how Allah punished the people of Ad and Samud and Qarun and Shaddad and Fir'aun and Nimrud and all these evil nations of before. Uh, why, uh, why he doesn't do the same to us? If you are a prophet and we are the kuffar, why doesn't he do that to us? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied, in an eye and saying that indeed Allah will not punish them, O Muhammad, as long as you are amongst them. So the presence of the Prophet, even amongst the kuffar, kept the bala away from them. So imagine his presence amongst us as Muslims. He's present amongst us in our hearts, in our minds, on our tongues, in our homes, spiritually. He's amongst his ummah. So indeed, it is his dua, it is his connection that keeps the bala away from us. That he prays for us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, as he said himself in a hadith uh, narrated by Abu Ya'la that my life is good for you and my death is good for you. They said, how ya Rasulullah? He said, well, my life is good for you because Allah gives me uh, a message and then I relay it to you fresh. This is the latest fresh message from Allah. And my death is good for you. They said, okay, we understand that. But how is your death going to be good for us? He said, because after I die, all your actions are presented to me. If I see good, I thank Allah for you. I make shukr. And if I see otherwise, I ask Allah forgiveness for you. In other words, while we are busy committing sins and doing wrong things that would attract Allah's punishment on us, our Prophet ﷺ is busy interceding for us. He is making shafa'ah for us. In his qabr, in the barzakh, in the spiritual world that he is in right now, he is praying to Allah to forgive us. We, we sin and he says, Ya Allah, forgive them. And because of that, and nothing else, only because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps the bala away from us. So that's what Imam Lusari says. Who al Habibul Lazi Turja Shafa'atuhu? He is the beloved whose intercession we hope for in when any calamity or problem faces us. And he's referring to his own calamity here as well. Da'a ilallahi fal mustamsikuna bihi mustamsikuna bihablin ghairi munfasimi. He says, indeed, he called towards Allah to all those who hold on to him are holding on to a rope that will never be severed. Are, are grasping onto a rope that will never be severed. You know, when you fall and you hold onto a rope to, to survive, but sometimes the rope breaks and you fall down. He says, this rope of Rasulullah will never ever break. It is the fastest, strongest rope that you can hold onto. It's the rope of Allah. And that's why uh, when Allah said in the Quran, 
واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا hold on together to, to the rope of Allah and do not be divided when they ask Ibn Abbas عنه, what is the rope of Allah that we all need to hold on to what's that rope it's in the Quran right hold on to the rope of Allah what's that rope Ibn Abbas عنه, replied it is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Hablullah. he is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we should uh, all hold on to him sallallahu he called towards Allah Ad'u ilallah. In the Quran, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described as Ad'u ilallah. I am the one who calls you to Allah. Now note here, he didn't say I am the one who calls you to Islam. He didn't say I am the one who calls you to Islam. Because Islam is not the goal. Islam is not uh, the goal. Islam is the means. But the goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes we end up worshipping Islam than Allah. Please remember, we don't worship Islam. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't worship the masjid. I know everybody is sad now. The, the masjids are going to be closed in, in Ramadan. We are sad. Everywhere. I'm sad. We are all sad about that. But we accept the will of Allah. We don't worship the masjid. We worship Allah. The masjid is just a means. Allah is the goal. So let us not forget that ever, please. That our worship of Allah will continue. It doesn't matter if the masjids are closed, if the Kaaba is closed. Even if the Kaaba is destroyed, as it will be at the end of times, the Prophet ﷺ predicted that we will still continue worshipping Allah. The Prophet ﷺ worshipped Allah in Mecca when they were, he wasn't allowed to pray by the Kaaba. They were not allowed to have a masjid. For 13 years, they had no masjid in Mecca, but they would still pray in their homes or when they come together uh, very privately. But mostly in their home, they pray. He would make a jama'ah with his wife Khadija, his adopted son Ali, his adopted son Zaid, and they pray. So uh, we, we need to understand that Rasulullah is the caller towards Allah, not caller to Islam. Yes, Islam. he called to Islam as a means to reaching Allah. And that's why when he's described in the Quran, he's described as da'iyan ilallah. The Prophet is a caller towards Allah. Da'ilallah. And that's what Imam Busari says. He called towards Allah, so all those who hold on to him are holding on to a rope that will never break. And then he says, وَفَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ فِي خَلْقٍ وَفِي خُلُقٍ وَلَمْ يُدَانُوهُ فِي عِلْمٍ وَلَا كَرَمِي He surpassed all the prophets. He surpassed all the prophets. خَلْقٍ وَفِي خُلُقٍ In his outward appearance, in his creation, وَفِي خُلُقٍ and his character. And none of them could reach his rank. None of them could reach his rank in knowledge or generosity. Knowledge or generosity. So all the prophets are great. We respect all the Anbiya. But none of them can reach the rank of our Prophet Sallallahu Not in knowledge, not in character, not in generosity, not even the appearance. Uh, he was the most handsomest of all, the most perfect of all, outwardly and inwardly. And I simply give you one example of that. Uh, if you look at many of the prophets that came before, you find them in the Quran, a lot of them, a lot of the times making dua for their nations to be destroyed. Right? Uh, Musa alayhi salam, he made a dua, uh, not Musa alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, when the kuffar did not want to believe in him, he said, Rabbi la tadar ala al-ardi min al-kafirin adayyara, inna ka in tadarhum lam yulidu illa kafiran fajjara. Oh Allah, do not leave a single kuffar kafir alive on this earth. If you leave them, ya Allah, they will only give birth to more kuffar and more evil people. So destroy them all, ya Allah. And Allah did destroy all of them. But our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the people of Makkah and Taif uh, chased him out and they beat him and uh, they, they tortured him, you know, they hit him with stones and cursed him and he was injured, he was, his body was full of blood. And he was crying, he was literally running out of Taif and he went to hide in, 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 a, in a garden and he was sitting there crying to Allah because of the sadness of how the people are treating with a human being. He's hurt, he's injured, he's bleeding. Jibreel alayhi salam appeared to him with the two angels who controlled the mountains of Makkah and Taif and said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has ordered, uh, Allah has sent these uh, uh, angels with me uh, to be in your service. And sallallahu alayhi salam said, how? So he said, well, Allah has seen how the people of Makkah and Taif treated you, the kuffar, and he's very angry at them, how they treated his beloved prophet. So if you want, Ya Rasulullah, I can order these two angels 
to shake Makkah and Taif, the mountains of Makkah and Taif, and it will cause an earthquake and it will kill all the kuffar in these two cities. It's going to kill all of them. You've been calling them for 10 years now, but they only respond to you with ugliness and hate and torture and abuse and physical violence. Allah will kill all of them in Taif and Makkah. So immediately the Prophet ﷺ stood up. He said, La ya Jibreel. He said, No, O Jibreel. Innama ana rahmatun muhda. I was sent as a mercy, not as a curse. O Jibreel, if these people don't believe today, maybe they will believe another time. If they don't believe another year, they will maybe believe before they die. And even if they don't believe before they die, maybe their children will believe one day. Or their grandchildren will believe one day. Subhanallah. He said, no, Jibreel, do not hurt them. Then he said, Allahumma. Uh, he said, uh, Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad. Allahumma fa innahum la ya'lamun. He said, oh Allah, guide my people, for they know not what they do. Guide my people. He still called those kuffar of Makkah and Taif, my people, my people. He said, oh Allah, guide my people, for they don't know what they do. They know not what they are doing. They are fighting me out of ignorance. Now compare that with Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam says, Ya Allah. He doesn't say guide them. He said, oh Allah, destroy all of them. I've done enough here of calling them. And uh, with regards to their children, he says, there's no hope. Even if they live, they're going to just give birth to more evil children. Destroy all of them. And that was a Jalali. Nuh alayhi salam had that Jalal. I'm not saying what he did is wrong. A prophet doesn't do anything wrong. I'm just showing that that was Nuh alayhi salam's judgment on those people. It was a valid judgment. But look at how greater than that, more generous than that, and more merciful than that was the, the judgment of the Prophet ﷺ on his kuffar. He said, oh Allah, don't do that to them. Maybe they will accept Islam in another year, maybe before they die. And if they don't accept Islam, maybe their children will accept Islam. So that's, that's just one example. I can give more examples, inshallah, and I will. Uh, but I wanted to conclude with this line in, in the Burda tonight, where Imam Busiri says that indeed, Faqan Nabiin, he surpassed all the prophets in his character, in his creation. Khalqin, meaning the way he's created, his beauty, outward beauty, khuluqin, and his character, his akhlaq. And indeed, they could not catch up with him, neither in his knowledge, neither in his generosity. Uh, they say the knowledge of all the prophets, of mankind, compared to the knowledge of all the prophets, is like a grain of sand in the middle of the desert. The knowledge of all mankind, compared to the knowledge of the prophets of Allah, is like a grain of sand in the middle of the desert. And the knowledge of all the prophets of Allah, compared to the knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is like a grain of sand in the middle of the desert. Allah gave him the knowledge that he did not give to any of his prophets sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa So nobody can reach his maqam. As Shaykh Ali Akbar Muhyiddin ibn Arab, he said that Adam alayhi salam was taught the, the, the names by Allah, but Muhammad Sallallahu was taught the meanings and the significances of all those names. So he was taught the names and their meanings. And Imam al Busiri says in the Burda, "Lakazatul ulum min alim al ghaybi, wa minha li Adam al asma'u. Wa lakazatul ulum min alim al ghaybi, wa minha li Adam al asma'u. O Muhammad, you were given the essence of all knowledge by Allah, while Adam was only given the names. He was given the titles, and you was given the entire chapter and the entire book and its meaning." So uh, may Allah bless uh, our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are honored to be the followers of the greatest of all the prophets, the, the most honorable of Allah's creation, the best of Allah's creation. May we be able to fulfill a little bit of the right of being from his followers. And uh, may Allah uh, restore a little bit of that pride in us of being from his followers, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And may Allah, through the barakah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, relieve us from the bala that we are in. May Allah bless the holy month of Ramadan for all of us, for those it's starting uh, tomorrow. For those who are fasting tomorrow in South Africa, it's going to be on Saturday, inshallah. And for the entire ummah of the Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah bless this Ramadan for you. Make it a Ramadan of rahmah and relief and khair and barakah and ridwan. May it be a great Ramadan of spiritual purification inside our homes, inshallah. May every home be a masjid. May every home, inshallah, be allied with the Quran and the recitation and the prayer. It's time our homes were revived, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we, we, we are not going to find Allah in the mosque this year. Uh, Allah is going to find us in our homes this year. Inshallah, we'll find him in our homes. This year, Allah wants, he's going to come to us, inshallah. 
So uh, let us all uh, be diligent. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Uh, we will continue with our classes, inshallah, in Ramadan. The timings will be announced to you because Ramadan is a month of knowledge. And what we are doing here is talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it is uh, in no way contradictory to Ramadan. So, Jazakallahu khairan for your attendance. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, al-Fatih lima ughlik, wal-Khatim lima sabak, nasir al-Haqib al-Haq, wal-Hadi ila suratika al-Mustaqim, wa ala alihi haqa qadrihi wa miqdahi al-Azim, subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun, salamun ala al-Mursaleen, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, Allahumma barik lana fi shahri Ramadan, wa khtimhu lana bil maghfirati wa al-Ridwan, wa al-Idq min al-Niran, wa stasallamuhu minna mutakabbal al-Diyya, arhamar rahimin. Shukran. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته